Libya's warlord Khalifa Haftar is forced into a retreat. An important airbase near the capital Tripoli is back in the hands of the UN-recognized government. Will this prolong the civil war or kickstart talks between the warring factions? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Bernard Smith. Khalifa Haftar told the world he's the only man who can bring stability back to Libya. The warlord launched a military offensive last year to take control of the capital from the UN-recognised government in Tripoli. But his forces have suffered a series of setbacks. In the latest, Haftar's forces lost control of the headquarters of his offensive, Al Watiya Air Base, southwest of Tripoli. Troops backing the government in Tripoli say they've destroyed weapons provided by Russia and the United Arab Emirates. And they've since retaken two towns close to the base. While Prime Minister Fayez Sarraj hailed the victory, he warned the battle is far from over. Haftar's spokesman downplayed the loss, saying they'd always planned to leave the base. This move was not made in the spur of the moment. It was planned for months. We've been pulling out strategic equipment and heavy military gear from the base. Three months ago, we pulled out the jet fighters and their ammunition and spare parts. Only yesterday, orders were given for personnel to withdraw under our air cover. The withdrawal was successful and we've moved the personnel and all the weaponry and ammunition. We have our own plans and we will recapture the air base. Al Jazeera's Mahmoud Abdel Wahid reports from Tripoli. The balance of power has been recently changing in favor of forces loyal to the internationally recognized government of national accord, uh, thanks partly to uh, Turkish air force, namely Turkish drones, that have been uh, playing a crucial and vital role in this uh, conflict. And meanwhile, Haftar's forces have been losing momentum, especially after they lost control of several strategic locations in the west of Libya, including Al Wutia Air Base, and also along with other strategic cities and towns along the western coast. Now, Al Wutia Air Base is very strategic and it was under Haftar's forces control for the past four years and a half. In fact, pro Haftar warplanes were taken off from that air base to target government forces locations in many areas in western Libya. And by losing it, Haftar's forces now no longer has any air base in the west of Libya. Meanwhile, the government forces say that they moved on other towns and cities in the western mountain, and they can now focus on repelling Haftar's forces' attacks in southern Tripoli. They say that after they seized Al Wutia air base, they have eliminated the threat coming from that Air base, and they can now focus on moving on Tarhuna city, the major and stronghold of Haftar's forces in the west of Libya. Mahmoud Abdul Wahid, Al Jazeera, for Inside the Story, Tripoli. Government forces have been making significant gains in recent weeks. They've retaken several towns and cities along Libya's western coast, and as we mentioned, took control of Al Wutia air base on Monday. This allows them to push towards Tahuna, south of Tripoli. The city is Haftar's last stronghold in the west. But his forces still control much of eastern Libya, where the oil terminals are located, as well as the south and the city of Sirt. Let's bring in our guests. In London, Peter Millett, a former British ambassador to Libya. In San Antonio, Texas, Mansour El Kikia. He's a professor of politics at the University of Texas in San Antonio. And in Machuchin, New Jersey, Jason Pack, a founder of Libya Analysis, a Libyan affairs think tank. Welcome to you all, gentlemen. I'll start with you, Peter. How significant is the loss of control of this airbase to Haftar's ambitions to control all of Libya? I think this is a significant moment, but we shouldn't overestimate it. Uh, it is a significant loss of an airbase. Uh, as your correspondent has said, it's the main, it's the only airbase that he had uh, in the west of Libya, uh, and it is a serious uh, withdrawal. But I think it raises 
a lot of significant questions. What does withdrawal mean? Um, will it mean a genuine ceasefire kicks in? And will it mean a commitment to a political process? I don't think we should assume that the war is over. There's a lot of weapons around on both sides. Uh, and I'm not convinced that Heftar's political ambitions have been uh, ended by any means uh, by what has happened yesterday in Al Wutia. So I think what I'd be looking for is a strong voice now from the international community and from Libyans as a whole that they now want a political process to kick in, starting with a genuine ceasefire, and then the UN to take the lead again in trying to bring all the different parties together, a very wide range of stakeholders, uh, and to learn the lessons of the past of trying to do deals between uh, small groups of people uh, without and excluding a wider group of stakeholders. So an opportunity, certainly, uh, but it has to be exploited quickly. Mansour, do you think this will make Khalifa Haftar reevaluate his ambitions to control all of Libya? No, I really don't think so. And I think you're reading too much into it. This is war. And war, you win and you lose sometimes. And, but uh, don't forget, Haftar is still in Tripoli. He still controls almost 90% of Western Libya. And more important, you know, He's depending on Libyans to defend him. Mr. Sarraj and the, the, the internationally recognized government is depending on Turks and militias and mercenaries from, from, from Syria. I mean, you have to, to take these into account. More, import, more important, I mean, the only thing he would have to would learn out of this is that finally it might, it, might, it might sink in that the West does not want him. And I think this is, this is good, you know. But unfortunately, you're talking about the internationally recognized government. And I think, and I think the catastrophe that Libya is facing is, and I'm sorry to the ambassador, you know, but it is the international government, that, that the international order that is, that is responsible for what's going on in Libya. The West has frankly been miserable in dealing with the Libyan affairs. They haven't stopped the arms shipment from getting in there. Libya is sinking deeper and deeper and deeper into a hall of chaos. And, uh, and uh, there's, there's no end in sight to any of this. Jason, Mansour suggests Libya is sinking into a hole of chaos, but does this mean that Haftar is going to have to think again about plans to control all of Libya? Most certainly. Um, to stress Ambassador Millet's point, this is a culmination of a longer-term process. When the war for Tripoli began on April 4th, 2019, General Haftar hoped to score a quick victory, aided by his Russian, Emirati, Egyptian, and French supporters. His offensive stalled. They had certain advantages. Then they lost Ghariyan in the summer of 2019, but they still had other advantages. They had the majority of foreign arms coming in to support them, and they had the hope that maybe Trump could be flipped. What's happened since December 2019 is that the Turks signed an MOU for a maritime exclusive zone, and they've entirely tipped the balance of power. Haftar used to have the aerial dominance, and now he's lost that aerial dominance. Turkish drones have entirely flipped who controls the skies over Tripolitania. As a result, first Sorman and Sabrata were lost in April, and now there was not any fighting at Watiya. Gradually, the LNA was forced to withdraw because they lost the ability to operate over the skies. Yesterday, they withdrew their last Zintani-aligned groups, and now they have no air base in Western Libya. The battle for Tripoli is over. Yes, the second Libyan civil war continues, but Haftar's ability to claim that he might eventually take Tripoli is a hollow reed. It's done. We're going to see a inter Nicene war within the East, maybe to oust Haftar, maybe to see a partition of Libya with Haftar or another LNA commander ruling just the East. So as the ambassador said, this is a very significant shift. And we need to see how the internationals are going to reposition their support. Might the Egyptians or Emiratis say, we support the LNA, but we want to replace Haftar? Might Haftar want to double down on Tarhuna? in which case he could have egg on his face if he yeah. loses Tarhuna. It's a very significant shift that we're seeing. OK, we'll come back to Turkey in a moment. But, Peter, first of all, it is far from over for Haftar. He's got 
control of much of much of the east of Libya and parts of the west. He's got the oil, he's blocking the export of oil. He's got plenty of options still, hasn't he? I don't think he has so many military options uh, anymore. I think uh, without that airbase uh, and with the loss of Gerian as well, um, I think his, uh, as, as Jason has said, the, his ability to take Tripoli, which was never uh, very strong, um, it has has disappeared. He, he has to now uh, withdraw it sufficiently for them to be a political process to open up. I, he, the, 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 the tribes, the militias and others, and I have to say that uh, criticising Heftar does not mean that I am in any way supportive of the militias. The militias in Tripoli are bad people. They have to be removed from the equation as well. But none of that can happen without a process which looks at a new political future, resolves the military issues, removes the militias, and puts in place economic reform as well. Those three factors, which were not part of the 2015 agreement, 2015 political agreement was only political. It didn't have military and security stakeholders. It didn't have economic stakeholders. It didn't even include the tribes, which is a major mistake. More stakeholders have to be involved in an integrated political, economic and security um, solution and approach for the new Libya. OK. Uh, Mansour, let me ask you about Turkey. Jason touched on it just before. Long-term now, long-term strategic interests for, Tur for Turkey in Libya because of that deal to split up the... to explore gas reserves, possibly in the Mediterranean. Will the backers of Haftar's forces, the UA and France, want to be in the fight for as long as Turkey is now clearly going to be involved in Libya? Will they have the stomach to go the distance? I, I, think, I, think, I think they will, in fact, be more involved now, because especially the Greeks, the Greeks are not, are not happy at all with this agreement. And believe it or not, nor, nor Eastern Libya is where supposedly Turkey is supposed to be uh, sharing territorial waters and fishing rights and oil and oil exploration. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, you know, but I think you're building too much into this, into this, uh, the, the, the Wutias take over. Yes, maybe maybe Hefter's position right now has declined, and, and I don't see his position being too weak, weakened within the East too much. You know, but he ultimately he has he has the guns. You know, and uh, and uh, Mr. Hefter is a military man. He has some support, but doesn't have much support in the east. Uh, not, not too much. I mean, and there is a lot of opposition for the fear of returning to 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 military rule. But the problem, let me tell you, in Libya, is, and as what I've seen it on on on, on, on physically, is is it, it, Libyans are tired. They're tired, and Hefter and Hefter is the, the only alternative right now to, to 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 maintain security and peace. They can't rely depend on the militias. The militias gave away Libya, and ultimately the militias are the ones. And the, and the ambassador is quite right. I mean, I, I understand exactly where he's coming from. But you have the, the government of national court, which is recognised, is dominated totally by the militias, and this is this is the big problem. It's not going to go away. The militias are not going to say tomorrow, oh, it's over. And they're not going to say to Turkey, no, thank you, Turkey, because they depend on Turkey's goodwill. And so Turkey basically has a free reign to do what it wants in Libya. Jason, how much will uh, Al-Saraj depend on what Turkey's view is as the way they move forward with this? How, what sort of influence does Turkey have on him? Well, this is a very important point. Um, Saraj has very limited power over the GNA and even less over Western Libya. He's not even the most important figurehead in his coalition. That's, of course, the interior minister, Fatih Bashara, who has not only reformed the quote-unquote military and connected the different militias together, but he maintains personally the relationship with the Turks and with the USA and other backers. To weave together various points that the ambassador and the professor have made, the influence of the Turks is, of course, malicious. They have malign goals for oil exploration in violation of international agreements. They threatened the very legitimate Greek and Cypriot exclusive maritime zones. And they're going to want their pound of flesh for winning in Libya. For example, the repayment of a lot of back payments on construction contracts. 
But as the ambassador pointed out, the reason that this war for Tripoli started and the second Libyan civil war continues is that the Sherat agreement was flawed. It didn't address the economic and tribal and structural drivers of the conflict. And nothing that has happened heretofore has. We need to deal with the central bank issues, smuggling, subsidies, and the root economic causes of this war. There was never going to be a military solution. And Haftar showed that a military solution cannot work. No one actor can conquer Libya. So Siraj, Fatih Bashaga, and all the militias in Libya can't conquer it. The Easterners would never let the West be conquered. Therefore, of course, some kind of political and economic reform process is now going to need to happen. Peter, could it be the case that Haftar is going to be persuaded to take control just of the eastern part of Libya, that the idea of a, any sort of unified Libya is so far in the distance, Haftar could just have the east? Well, I, people have often suggested a partition of the country. Uh, but I think it's not a it's not an easy solution by any means, and it, I don't believe it's a solution that the majority of Libyans want. Uh, not least because much of the oil comes from the south through the east and west. How would you share out the the economic benefits uh, of the oil production? Um, I do think more decentralisation is uh, a better solution. So you have very limited powers at the centre. Well, you do have a single identity for the country, but then you devolve budgets and responsibility, and I think that might work either to regions or to towns or to municipalities. But I don't think partition uh, is something that uh, the international community or even Libyans should uh, envisage or think might be a solution to their problems. Mansour, uh, do you think now is the time that Haftar can be persuaded to sit down and talk now that he's on... I know it's not all over, he's not necessarily on the back foot, but is this the time to speak to him and tell him to sit down and talk? Um, you know, talking to Hefter, personally, I just I talked to him and I asked him precisely the same question, you know, and I, it, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't seem to be very enthusiastic about talking to Mr. Saraj and, uh, and basically now Bashar. Uh, I don't think, I think it's a matter of trust. And the trust is no longer there anymore that Mr. Siraj or the East or the West would, in fact, uh, buy, buy whatever with the degrees. So did you talk to him before this, or this, after he lost control of this base? After. No, no, not before. He lost control just now with the, yeah. with the, with the Rutia. But, uh, I spoke to him in, uh, in February, in February when I, when, I, when, I, when I was there. But circumstances because, have changed. I, I, yeah, and ultimately, ultimately, ultimately I, I looked around and... and, and it's, it's a dismal situation. Poverty in Libya, hunger. Uh, it's just, just didn't make it, and I was telling him precisely of that issue, and he knows about this issue. But apparently, he's hard-headed in that sense that he doesn't want to give up. He doesn't. He doesn't give up easily, and I think he will keep on. He will keep on going in this, in this, in this matter, because partly because there's nobody to negotiate with in the, in the West. That's the problem. I mean, unless you want to talk with the militias, and I think nobody, you know, no, nobody wants to do that. At least nobody in the East wants to do that. And unfortunately, within the West, and this is the major problem, is that the Westerners themselves, there's so much animosity be between areas in the West. There's so much animosity that nobody's willing to take up arms to stop the militias. Jason, Mansour uh, paints a depressing picture there. There's nobody for Haftar to speak to. We do have in Europe, France and Italy, for example, on different sides of this, where do we go to if we want man if we want Khalifa Haftar to sit down and talk? Who does he talk to? Well, that's right. Haftar has shown that psychologically he doesn't want to compromise. When he was in Russia in January to sign a quote unquote ceasefire, which wasn't going to do anything, he still walked away without signing it. He proclaims that he's winning even when he's losing, and he refuses to admit defeat when it's handed to him. In fact, we could see he's a lot like other neo-populist want-to-be dictators who, for example, are unwilling to admit that they got the coronavirus wrong and are unwilling to admit when things look bad in the economy. We've seen that as a trope throughout the world recently. However, fortunately, Haftar doesn't really matter that much anymore. If the Russians, Emiratis and Egyptians could agree on a candidate to replace him within the LNA, be it Abdul Razak al or be it a more minor officer, and they could have the support of the tribes, that's fine. Haftar's sons could be sidelined, 
and the LNA could exist as an institution which could have talks done without Haftar. And the key thing here is it's a time for the US, UK, and other neutral players to re-engage. Of course, Italy and France, as you mentioned, are on opposite sides. But if neutral players could bring Italy and France, as well as the key backers of the two sides, i.e. Turkey on the one side and the UAE on the other, to say, hey, this mutually hurting stalemate is coming into being. The GNA can't all of a sudden take Eastern Libya. That's fanciful. We have a mutually hurting stalemate, and it doesn't benefit anyone for the war to continue. Maybe now, finally, it will dawn on the key backers of the coalitions. Wow, it would actually behoove us to talk sense into our clients. And since we're the patrons, we can use our support to leverage a deal to happen. I don't see that materializing without US or UK or UN kind of engagement from the level of adults, getting the children in the room and saying, this fight is no longer going to be worth throwing sand in your opponent's eyes. Why don't we, for the best of everyone, try to have a mature solution? OK. Peter, do you think, given how important the stability of Libya is to the European Union in terms of it's awash with weapons, it's a migrant jumping off point, is there a chance that the EU might now seize this opportunity to try and bring the two parties together, given that France and Italy are on opposite sides? Well, I think the EU has suffered from divisions within its own uh, organisation, particularly between the Italians and the French, who have both been vying for the prime position, uh, the pole position, in terms of leading on, on, on Libya. The uh, Berlin process, which the Berlin conference, which took place in January, put Germany and the United Nations in the lead. And I think it has to be the United Nations, but that the, the clear divisions within the international community need to be resolved, uh, need to be brought together on a single track. We need a replacement for Hassan Salame, the UN special representative. Uh, somebody needs to be appointed. The current acting uh, envoy is very, very good, but we need someone new in there to regenerate that UN process bringing together as wide a range of Libyan players as possible. Uh, it's right, it's not just Heftar talking to Siraj. It has to be a much wider group of players, and it has to be based. I, as uh, Professor Mansour said, there's a lot of animosity. Reconciliation and inclusivity needs to be a fundamental parts of this new process. Libyans themselves, it has to be a Libyan owned. It can't be the Turks telling Libyans what to do. It can't be the Emiratis or the EU or anybody else. It has to be a Libyan owned process with okay. the United Nations in the lead. All right, Mansour, just quickly, very quickly with you, Jason already hinted at it. Is Haftar the problem? Do we need somebody else to talk to? No, no. I think. Listen. I think. I'm, I'm sorry. Haftar will still be a player, and in any new future, future, future Libya, he will still have to be a player. He will not give up, and he has enough support to make him a player. So he's not. He's not. He's not insignificant. He is significant. My perception of this that we have to rely on the only legitimate body that we have in Libya, however bad it is. It might be bad. It might be miserable, but it is the only legitimate body, and that is the Libyan Parliament. Whatever it looks like. This is the only one that, that, that is elected, you know, and it, and it has to play a bigger role in, the, in this, this whole issue. And this is, this is where Europe and the international community can actually become very, very, very important in providing the support for the Libyan parliament, bypassing Haftar, bypassing the, the militias. And this is, this is the big problem with, with the GNA, is that it did not even deal with the parliament, and the parliament is, whether we like it or not, is the only okay. elected body in the country. All right. Unfortunately, gentlemen, we're out of time, but I'd like to say thanks very much to Peter Millett, to Mansour Al-Kika and to Jason Pack, and thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com, and for further discussion, go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story and I am at Jazeera Bernard. From me, Bernard Smith, and the entire team here in Doha, bye for now.